Well, good morning again, and welcome to the house of God, the Vineyard Church of God. I expect that your week was blessed. We prayed for you. We prayed about you, prayed about uh, situations that are coming up, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, putting off the old man. I know that during this this virus that has been going on, that you know, being enclosed, being at home, uh, not being able to go out and do the things that that you want to do normally, uh, whether it be going to the park, going to the stores, you know, the stores that you like to go to. I, I know you can go to the food stores, but. There are places where I'd like to go, you know, be able to just browse around in stores. Uh, my son went to the mall the other day and, uh, you know, a couple of their good stores that they like weren't even open. Um, so it, it causes a little bit of anxiety and, uh, you know, sometimes you get angry. Sometimes you, you want to cause wrath upon somebody. But, uh, you know, that's what we want to talk about is putting off the old man, putting on the new man. And, and what it meant when Paul was, was talking to the Colossians about this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read through Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17 today. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and hit the points in this, the, the, the key points as we read it verse by verse. Uh, just so you can get a little bit of an idea of what he was talking about. And you may get a little nugget of something out of it that will hit you personally and that's what we hope all the time when we come in and read God's Word that God is going to place something on your heart that his word is going to have a different meaning from time to time uh, when you read it over and over uh, there's always something new that, that we get out of it so this is Paul and he's talking to the Colossians and we're talking about putting off and putting on putting off the old stuff, the old world, the old man. And when you accept Christ, you become a new man and you start putting on the new, you know, getting rid of the old. Uh, and there's different ways of thinking about what the old is, uh, what we need to get rid of, what we need to, to actually bring into our, our own bodies, our own temples. After all, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. It dwells inside of us. And this is the house of God. And all together, Christians, we are the church. So we are all in one body, one family, and that's God's family. So if we go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, starting out, it says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. Because of, thing, of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Now let's go back to verse 5 again, where it says, Therefore put to death, put to death your members which are on the earth, the stuff of a world that is, that is in the old man, that you carry with you, that stuff that's before you knew Jesus Christ, sometimes even after you've accepted the Lord, the sins of the world, the things that Satan is putting out, tempting you and putting in your path, they control you. Now, you say, well, I'm not controlled by anybody. I control my own self and, and my own actions. But do you really, when you think about it, do you control all the actions that are taking place? Because it says the death of the members which are on the earth, which are fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is the idolatry. If you've gotten rid of all those, you're doing, you're doing real good. That's your new man. The new man is coming up. The old man is being washed away. And that's what we want to look at is are our bodies, our temples, which house the Holy Spirit of God, are they clean? Are they pure? Are they filled with the stuff of the new man? Or are we still holding on to the old man? Let's go to verses 8 and 9. Removing the other traces of worldliness, 
yes, there are traces. Even though we've got rid of the ones that, that were before in those other verses, they still have more that we need to get rid of. And this is where we really start looking at ourselves and looking deep with inside of ourselves to see if we are doing what God wants us to do. He says in verse 8, starting out, he says, But now you yourselves are to put off all, the, all these things, which are anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Let's go back to verse 8. It says, but now you yourselves are to put off all these things, all of them. Get rid of all of them. You can't just take one and say, well, I want to keep that one. I want to get rid of the other one. And I'm still a new man in Christ. You can't do that because Paul is sitting here. He's saying this in order to become a full new man, a new person in Christ, a new body to be in the family of God. He said, put off your anger in your wrath and your malice and your blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth when we talk about anger and wrath and malice what controls you is that you choosing your your decision to okay even though i'm a christian i'm going to be angry i'm going to be filled with that anger and that malice am i going to cause a blasphemy am i going to keep doing this or do you stop and think about who is in charge of the anger and the wrath and the malice and the blasphemy? Who is in charge of that? that all, that's all sin. That's against God. And where does the sin come from? It comes from Satan himself of the world. So what are we still doing? We are allowing Satan to control us and to tell us what we are to do and where to go and when to do it. Are we to be happy or are we to be angry? Are we supposed to be sad? What are we supposed to be? If Satan is in charge of it, you're going to constantly be angry. You're going to be constantly looking for other people to be mad at, to put blame on. And how about the filthy language that comes out of our mouth? I've heard Christians with filthy mouths. They still let it spew out of the mouth and they call themselves Christians. I pray you're not like that. If you are, then you need to do a checkup. Check yourself. Is it Satan that is controlling what you say, or are you in control of what you're saying? If you're in control of your sin and you're pushing sin out to other people, that's not right. That's the old man. You're letting Satan pull the strings and tell you where to go and what to say, how to say it. The world looks at Christians. They look at you. And what they see in you, what you spew out of your mouth, what you, you know, the way you talk to people, the way you approach people, the world looks at you and says, oh, that's the way a Christian's supposed to act, huh? Well, that's no different than what I am. That's no different than those that are in the world. We are different, and we have to start acting different. Clean up the language. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. I had a, uh, a, a message here from, from Wright. He wrote on this. I'm going to comment from him on this part where it says, You have put off the old man with his deeds. That means in Jesus Christ, the saints of God are different people. We're different people because we have gotten rid of the worldly stuff and we've accepted the godly stuff and that is our lifestyle that's what we do we speak godly stuff we we approach people in a godly way we don't do it by means of satan pulling the strings and therefore he says this is what Wright says when a tide of passion or a surge of anger is felt it must be dealt with as the alien intruder it really is and turned out of the house as having no right to be there at all, let alone to be giving orders. To have let Satan have this much power in your life to tell you what to do and how to say it, how to approach people, to be angry at people instead of, you know, feeling merciful 
Okay, instead of doing this, Satan is in control. And he's saying it's just like an intruder coming into your house. Would you want an intruder to come into your house, your personal space, and start giving orders to you and you have to take them? That is the same way that the devil comes into your life and into your house and into your families, your jobs, every place that you are. If you let him in there, he is going to tell you what to do. Do you want Satan to be running this temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit? Because I tell you what, when sin is inside the temple, the Holy Spirit doesn't reside there. You need to have a clean temple. It needs to be run by God, not by Satan. So let's move to chapter, or verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, uncircumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, they, ever since I was young, they've always talked about peace on earth, you know, having a one uniform, you know, peace. Everybody getting along together. This was written way back with Paul, writing to the Colossians. He's talking to them. This is the same as what everyone has been asking for, peace. How do I get peace? How does this world become one accord and in one family, one peace. How do we do this? Paul has been saying this all along. It's been written down in God's word. So we can always look back on it. This is how we do it. You have to kick the devil out. You have to get him out of your house. You have to get him out of the temple. Put the Holy Spirit back in the temple. Now when he's saying this, on this one section in verses 10 and 11, as we put off the old man, we must put on the new man. We must do that. We can't just, you know, sort of take off the old man. Okay, we're going to keep part of the old man and keep part of the new man. Uh, you can't do that because once you still have the old man in you, you're still the old man. You're not the new. It's not the new man. We want to be new in Christ. We're going to be new glorifying God and, and expanding his kingdom. Amen? That's what we want to do. Now verses 12 through 17, this is the life of the new man. This is the life. This is what we can expect when we do all this, when we get rid of all of what Satan's been, been pushing on us and telling us we have to do and forcing us to, to do this. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be forced to do anything. If I want to do it, it's going to be by my choice, not by someone else's, not by Satan's. It's not his choice. This is my choice. This is my life. My life belongs to Christ. Christ is the one that sacrificed his all, his life for me, for you, for all the sins of the world. He sacrificed. That's who I want to serve. Now it says in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, we are the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, and that is bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Let's go back to, uh, let's go back to 12, because I want to really look at this. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. God showed his mercies to you. He showed his mercies to me. We are in the, uh, in, in the presence of a merciful, forgiving God. 
So what he has shown to us, we need to show also to others. That, therefore, we put on the tender mercies. We put on kindness, being kind to people. And it's not just a, a oh, you know, a happy day, good smile, glad things are going your way. No, you need kindness and humility and meekness. You know, that humility goes, goes pretty far when something happens in, in your life and you consider, wow, that is a, a high praise moment. And people come up to you and they say, really good job, good job. You know, you, you did fantastic. You worked hard for this. You worked hard for the, hard for the money. You know, you worked hard for the money. Yeah. You worked hard for it, but who gave you the ability to work hard for it? Who gave you the ability to have that job position? Who gave you the ability to make that money? God did. And since God is the one that gave you the ability to do what you do, you need to give him thanks. You need to give him glory. You need to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. That is what we need to do. I've seen too many people take credit for something that God did and they're not humbling themselves. There is no humility. We need to start doing that. Thank God from our hearts, all that is within us for all that he is doing, all the blessings that he is giving. We may have to work hard for it, but Jesus also had to work hard for it also. He had to work hard for us enough to where he worked himself to death. Simply saying it, putting it out there. Go to 13 again. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. In our long suffering, I want you to know that you're not going through anything alone. If you're with the family of God, that's a big family. There are resources out there where family can go and find whatever help they need, whatever support they need. You can find it because we share it together. The long suffering we share, bearing it with one another and forgiving one another. You know, in the Bible, it also says that we are to forgive not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. We forgive, we're forgiving people. God forgave us. Jesus forgave us. When he was on the cross, he says, Father God, forgive them for they know not what they do. We didn't know what we were doing. They didn't know what they were doing. But he forgave anyway. We need to forgive as Christ forgave us. Go on to verse 14. But above all these things, all these things that, that we had talked about, whether it be the, uh, the tender mercies, the kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, above all that, we have to put love. It says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. God is love. You always hear that. God is love. He is the love that binds everything together. When you love your neighbor as you love yourself, that's a bond that, that, that is coming together, that it's a, like a, a pact that holds the, the family of God together. That's love. It's a, which is the bond of perfection. Next. We have verse 15, it says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. We gotta be thankful for what he has done for calling us into one body. We are a member of God's family. The only thing that should be controlling our lives, that, that, that should be controlling whether we have anger or frustration, we don't need that. We don't need that. If you feel anger coming your way, stop. Think about it. Talk to God. Ask God about it. What should I do? 
I guarantee you by the time you get finished talking with God, you're going to be calmed down. There isn't going to be any anger because God doesn't support anger. That is something that comes from Satan himself. Verse, verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now, I'm going to finish out with these here, 16 and 17, because I want you to, to think about this not as Paul giving it to the Colossians, but giving it to you. This is to us in God's family. This is to the Christians. This is what he wanted us to know. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but the wisdom is, in, is the way that you use it. It's not just knowing what is in here, it's how you use it. It's not just the knowledge that God has given you inside. Excuse me. It's not just what he's given you inside, but it's how you use it from inside to bring it out. It's what other people see. He says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him, through Jesus. You know, it also says that the only way to get to the Father is through Jesus Christ, his Son. That's why we pray to Jesus. And we always end our prayers, in Jesus' name we pray. It's because we have to go through him. He, he was sacrificed for us, for our sins, for the sins of the world so that we could be free, so that we could be a member of God's family, so that we could enjoy the blessings that he gives and it comes our way, so that we could bless others with what he blesses us with, and we can share that loving kindness to everyone that we meet. Father God, I thank you for your word today. And I pray, Father God, that it touches the ears of the people that are watching this video, that they can hear your word, your loving kindness, your tender mercies, your forgiveness. That, Father God, give them the strength to clean out the temple, to bring back the Holy Spirit into their temple. That, Father God, that the world that is out there that is still in darkness and sin, they can see the light within us. So that they want to know you, Father God, to increase your kingdom. We pray this. Hallelujah. I ask for blessings to be upon each and every person, Father God, that is out there today that is watching this video, that hears the sermon, that hears your word, Father God, the very words that you inspired Paul, that, Father God, that it reaches inside of them deep, touches their innermost heart, their innermost being. Let it fester inside, Father God. Let the light grow. Let it shine through the darkness. I ask for your financial blessings to be upon everyone out there that is suffering from this, this coronavirus that is going around, Father God. Bless them and increase to them, Father God. Give, give them their, their jobs back. Give a better job back. We ask for your blessing to be upon us, Father God. In all that we do, we do for you, for your glory for your kingdom, Father God. And we ask for your protection to be upon each and every one of us. A hedge of protection around your people, those that accept you, Father God, that accept your son, Jesus Christ. Protect them from whatever evil comes their way. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I also want to know if, uh, if you're watching out there. So at the comment part underneath the video, please watch it all the way through. 
We want you to be blessed. We want you to hear God's word. If you have any prayers that, that you need, please write them in the comment below. If not, go to the vineyardcog.com and put a message in our contacts. It goes straight to the email for the vineyard and we check that and we will be praying for you on our Wednesday night uh, prayer night at seven o'clock. We all come in here and we pray over everything that comes in and we've seen miracles coming out of God's prayers. The prayers that, that he listens to from his people. We see miracles happening all the time. You're a miracle. You're watching this. You're a miracle. I hope that your testimony is a good one, that you spread it around to, to those that need to hear a word of encouragement or to be lifted up, to be shown kindness, that need some mercy. Show them tender mercies. Also in the comment section, Write down how many of you watched. Give us a thumbs up. And we pray for you to have a blessed week. And we'll see you back here again, same time, this next weekend. God bless.